Thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we are very happy to have David Wallace joining us tonight. He is a former business and technology reporter for the New York Times and Reuters. He is going to be, he's also a journalism lecturer at the Boston University, and he's going to be sharing some tips and tactics to ensure that you get useful facts about politics, social media, and pandemic reports by going beyond the headlines. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let's jump in uh, with the usual introduction of uh, thanks to all the reference librarians, uh, especially the folks who've been working remote uh, and are now starting to get reopened and, and back in the business. Um, there are a number of spots along the way tonight that we'll have chances to stop and uh, do Q&A, uh, use the chat, especially if there are terms or uh, specific vocabulary that don't make sense to you or are in conflict with what you uh, already know. Um, another invitation, uh, especially for people who are young, meaning teenagers, college students, uh, not familiar with old school media, and people who've come here from other countries. So if you grew up in a place like Mexico or India or another country that has a different news and media and press experience than the US, um, there's no question that election coverage or uh, official government coverage is done very differently in the US. So by all means, uh, let me know what your experience is and we can talk a little bit about how things are different, both uh, legally or culturally, or uh, just as a matter of habit uh, with the US and especially the First Amendment compared to other countries or other experiences. Uh, likewise, please use the chat if there are questions that you want to raise. Uh, I would find that there's a lot of uh, folks who uh, ask questions along the way. Uh, people who speak professionally for a living tell me that it's a good way to get the audience on your side by using a joke, usually at your own expense. Uh, I will start off in that tradition by telling you that I am not the Hawaiian mystic or the famous author or most of the other David Wallace's you may have heard of. Um, and the reason I point that out is because journalism, is, journalism generally is about building trust, uh, trust with your sources of information as well as trust with your audience. So I'm going to try and do that by making a couple of observations uh, at my own expense and explaining to you that in addition to trust, you have to get facts and proof. So again, it's a shades of gray thing. It's a detail. Um, if I wanted to impress you, I would tell you I was a uh, professor at the journalism program in Boston University, uh, I was an adjunct instructor. And what that means is I was an employee for hire. I was not a ranked or tenured professor. Uh, students tend to use that phrase just because instructor is kind of clunky. Um, I try to be as factually accurate as possible mostly so that there's no misunderstanding down the road. Uh, so I was a contract employee. So I have written for the New York Times and Reuters and Wired and other publications in the past. Um, I hope that gets me some cred. And if it does not, or if there are other details you need to find, there's a lot that's on the internet. Uh, I am very findable, but not very stalkable. Uh, you're not going to hear me refer to media because media is the thing. It's the delivery. So it's a TV program, a website, a radio broadcast. Uh, news is what's news to you. 
Um, it's information that you can use. It's not objectively something that everybody shares. So part of this discussion needs to be about what is news? What's the information that's useful to you? Does it come from a reputable source? And how do you know when you're getting news as opposed to analysis, which is people talking about why something happened? Uh, analysis may be a discussion of what happened that caused news, what's going to happen as a result of news, uh, facts or weather or details that are relevant. Um, that may include opinion because analysis comes from trying to look at the various reasons why something happened. Uh, what's the underlying cause? Can it be stopped from happening again in the case of an accident? Uh, there are lots of different kinds of news and journalism. So part of the discussion tonight has to look at where do you get your news? What kind of information are you getting? Is it facts? Is it opinion? Is it somebody else's definition of what is news? Um, this slide explains a couple of the different types and whether that's a documentary film or a tweet. There may be pieces of information or news that you find useful, um, but a news story is basically what's in the center of this screen. The five W's that a news reporter or somebody on the scene has been able to gather information that's verified and typically delivered by uh, what's called a fact-based or standards-based news organization. Uh, the AP, the New York Times, a TV station, a radio station, even that definition of a website uh, is something we're going to talk about tonight because not all news delivery outlets are created equal. Um, it's also worth pointing out that fake news has been around a long time. That's another term I'm not going to use because if it's information that's useful, even if it's wrong, it may be entertainment, it may be satire, it could be somebody's idea of a joke that didn't land, but the idea of using somebody in a suit coat and tie to deliver information, whether it's in a TV commercial or Saturday Night Live, has always been a way of sort of poking fun at both the news outlets and the news itself as a thing. Um, so a good starting point for the conversation is to ask you to, to either respond in the chat directly or raise a hand and ask a question, uh, where do you get your news? Do you get it from a standards-based news organization like a broadcast, uh, a website? Do you get it from your friends or your family who are sending you social media? Uh, do you get it in your Twitter feed, in your Insta feed? Uh, do you listen to somebody on YouTube who might have an influencer program where they run down the different sources of news? Uh, I find that teens especially get headlines in short messages, maybe by text from people they know, but they don't go deeper. They don't check the source of the news, uh, the story itself. They don't verify by checking a second or third site. Uh, the reason this matters is if you're getting information via WhatsApp and the message disappears, all you've got is a vague recollection of somebody told me something about a thing and it's on the internet somewhere. I'll just go to Reddit and I'll try to confirm. Um, so if you have specific questions about a channel, about a story delivery system, uh, by all means, raise a hand, put something in the chat, and we can take a look at it live to see what you're getting, what are the details that matter, and what are the pros and cons. Obviously, if you're getting 
SMS updates from the New York Times or CNN, that's verified information. If you're getting it from Uncle Sid, chances are there's a better, better chance that it's not verified or it's not the complete story. Um, another thing to, to keep in mind is that actual information comes from unconventional sources. Uh, the Twitter account for stairs helping to educate people on the Twitter to look at sources, to look at information, to verify news that they get. Uh, they do it not because it helps spread the news about lunchtime, um, but it is amplifying this idea that we need to be media literate and news literate. We can't just use Snopes or Fact Check or Urban Dictionary uh, to check things on a regular basis. It's exhausting. Um, it's really difficult, but there are fortunately media literacy now programs. Uh, news literacy project is primarily educating kids from grades K through 12. So younger uh, kids in school to get a better sense of if they're doing research for homework, they don't just go to Wikipedia. They don't just go to Reddit and copy the notes out of the bottom and say, I'm done. Uh, the idea is to look at what's a news source that's credible, that's ability, that's able to be cited with some confidence. Um, a question that came from the chat is, would I trust posts made by different activist accounts on Instagram? Um, we'll get into that in a little more depth. I think the answer is... Uh, coming soon in small parts and pieces. Uh, a, an answer you're going to hear me give an awful lot this evening is it depends. Um, there are certain sources or um, news outlets that I trust more than others, uh, especially in the case of an activist. Uh, people tend to look at things that they agree with. So I would be concerned to your example of, is it an activist account that supports my point of view? Uh, for example, Kyrie telling us that the earth was flat. If I believe that the earth is flat, then I'm sticking with Kyrie. Uh, there are lots of other accounts that might disagree and present other evidence. So the issue is, what are the accounts that you're hearing from? What is the information that you're not getting? Uh, because clearly there are other people who don't believe the earth is flat. Uh, they've got a point of view and they've got some facts to back it up. Um, in general, there are, are varying points of view, but there are some facts that are pretty much not in dispute. Um, one is that the earth is not flat. Uh, another is it's evening here in Boston. Uh, we are getting towards sunset, but yet there are other parts of the earth that are right now having a different season, having darkness instead of daylight. And multiple facts, multiple points of view can all coexist, but we have to understand that it's not as simple as if my fact is true, your fact has to be false. Uh, we've gotten a lot of that from politics in the last few years. Uh, we've gotten a lot of it from people digging into their viewpoint on whatever the topic uh, and not able to hold more than one view at one time. So here are a couple of points that are, are along those lines useful to keep in mind. Um, every photograph has something going on that's out of your view. Uh, fortunately, you can see me from the waist up. Uh, you're going to have to take my word for it that what's here in this mug is water. If I tell you, and we've built trust up to this point, maybe you take my word for it. Uh, 
if you really want me to hold it up to the camera and prove that there's no brown liquor inside, then we get to a different level of trust and verify uh, information that you think is relevant and helps you either build trust, gain credibility, uh, understand better uh, what the news is or what the information is that you're receiving. Uh, photographers have to do a really good job of taking an image, either still or video, that gets the point across, gets the information conveyed, but also makes it understandable to somebody looking at it so that they're not asking, well, what happened just out of the frame? What happened behind the photographer? Um, there's lots of different ways that behind the scenes news uh, gets to be a real issue of how do you account for every possible viewpoint or stakeholder? Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions about whose voice um, in the case of, for example, the U.S. Airways flight that dropped into the East River, there were no news journalists on the ground, in the water, on the shore. So all we had at that point was citizen journalists using their cameras to document what was going on from inside of the plane. Um, this is a good point to stop and take a look at what else besides the story is going on. These are things that you need to keep in mind in terms of your response as an audience, as somebody who's trying to gather news and do it in a reasonable way. Um, fortunately, I have smart friends who are neuroscientists because the panic reflex, the, oh my God, that's terrible news response is part of what people call the lizard brain. Um, it's the part of the brain called the amygdala that's all about flight response from danger, uh, thinking of a worst case scenario. Uh, and fortunately, the amygdala does that sort of stop, take a second look at the facts, take a less panicky assessment of what's going on that you're seeing or hearing about, look for a simpler explanation rather than the worst case scenario. And your brain needs to sort of be trained to stop, think, think again, look for a simpler explanation, gather more facts, come up with a better explanation of what you're seeing. Um, another issue is who's profiting from telling you this information? Um, the business motive of the activist accounts, the social media accounts that want you to click, uh, that want you to send money, that need you to do something right away, uh, need you to drop everything and be outraged. So the neuroscience part of be outraged, the social media reach of immediacy, that sort of we're doing this right now and we need you to answer in the next 10 minutes. Um, all of those are the business models that make you think about, okay, stop and, and let the prefrontal cortex do its rational thinking because how is this gonna help me? How is this gonna help somebody else if I click, if I like, if I share, if I send you money? Um, all of those are ways that your attention span becomes part of the business model. Um, you get to participate in the news is the way that some accounts try to position it. But in fact, you're being used. You're being used as a repeater or an amplifier. And if you stop and think about that, you might decide, no, that's not really for me. That's not what I want to do in interacting with the news. Um, deciding what's important enough that you're going to participate or go deeper or gather facts. Um, that's another part of the, you know, of the discussion, the business model of 
what information are you giving up? Um, you and I are not seeing the same thing on our home screens because if you're in Quincy using Comcast and I'm not in Quincy and I'm using Verizon in another town in my secure bunker, not in the city limits, there's a better than average chance that the ads that are served, the sites that I'm seeing, the information that I'm getting is different. Um, it's what's called a filter bubble. The more pictures of cute cats you click on, the more pictures get served to you of cute cats because the server ad network knows that you click, you get fed more information, more messages, more pictures, more you know of your friends in your feed because the algorithms behind that know what activates you and what does it. Um, so again, that's a combination of the neuroscience and the business. It's as relevant for news on the internet because everybody sees something different. It's not like a TV broadcast where it's just sent out to thousands or millions of people. Um, it really is personalized and you can get as specific as you want in terms of micro-targeting your neighborhood, your block, the citizen app that gives you information from your local police uh, at a very micro-targeted level, but often think about the other side of the telescope, widening the focus so that you're not just getting only your friends and family in your filter bubble, only the channels that you agree with from a political viewpoint, from an issue viewpoint. Um, we're going to start getting into some of the tools that are online um, with sites that you can go to to fact check, uh, tools that you can use when you get information uh, to decide, is this important? Is this a story that deserves more attention? Um, here's one more piece of the psychology of news, that sort of uh, relevant because of the QAnon uh, conspiracy theory, uh, the ways that people like to think that if they've seen three news stories in a row about traffic, then traffic is a big deal and it really matters and it's super important. Um, that may or may not be the case. Uh, but we like to have patterns. We like to have explanations rather than just assuming that it's a random day, you're stuck in a traffic jam, you were hit by a rainstorm. Uh, so it really matters what you think in terms of keeping an open mind, not getting so tied down to a specific reason why that you can't think about other parts and pieces of what you're seeing as the daily news. Um, here's a basic smell test. Does it pass the smell test? Is it fishy? Are the details sketchy, unclear? Do we not know who the source of the information is? Um, an awful lot of news comes from official sources. So a press release that was given to a lot of news media organizations, uh, a press conference where members of the press can ask questions. So tonight, think of yourself as members of the press and you can ask me questions and trust or hope that I'm going to give you a straight fact-based, no bull answer um, because Essentially, you're now in the position of being the fact finders, uh, deciding if I'm credible, deciding if the information is useful and usable, and I hope having some idea of whether social news or whether going to other websites to see if I've done this for other libraries gives you any greater confidence that the information I give you is going to be the same answer I gave to Newton or Hopkinton or other places 
in the classroom where I've talked to students or in some cases, older adults who are very set in their news gathering so that uh, they watch the TV news at six and 11. That's how they get information. Uh, they may not go to a website during the day and try to fact check their information or talk to other people and get a different interpretation of a particular set of facts. Um, and since I've been talking at you for the better part of 25 minutes, now is a good time to either unmute if there are questions you want to ask by voice. Uh, there's a question in the chat we can get to, Carrie. Yeah, so the schools teach the CRAT method as part of their media <laughs> literacy. Um, and so that stands for uh, currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Is, mm -hmm. is there a preferred acronym that students should be using as one better than the other? I, I, there really isn't. I, these are variations of, of the same general principle of, does it matter to you? Is it from a credible source? Is it relevant? Is it designed to motivate you to do something that you wouldn't ordinarily do? If you didn't wake up this morning hopping mad about a particular issue and you saw a news story that made you angry, you need to think about the neuroscience. You need to think about the business mo model of the activist organization. Are they trying to get you to donate? Um, the crap model or method is interchangeable with the smell test or other models because you have to decide what is it that you're doing? Are you personalizing the information and trying to decide if it matters to you or are you trying to fact check it and verify for reasons of, I'm going to verify this before I share with somebody else. Uh, I'm going to tell somebody why this matters to me for political reasons, for mo emotional reasons, uh, for social reasons, for the reasons of coming up with an argument. Uh, it may be something as simple-minded as, I don't like a particular piece of music. I'm not going to tell you that it stinks. I'm going to tell you the reasons why I don't like it. Um, one of the exercises I, I use with students is, don't tell me your opinion. Tell me a detail that illustrates. So don't tell me it's an ugly hat. Describe it for me in such a way that as a reader, as a viewer, if I'm not seeing it, I can understand and make an opinion of my own of, gee, that's really an ugly hat. Uh, unless it's something that is so out there and obvious, like an ugly Christmas sweater, and you're doing a story about gee, this is Kenneth, and Kenneth really grooves on having the ugliest ugly sweater. Um, and at that point, it's not an opinion, it's Kenneth's opinion, and it's something that, that he thinks is relevant to his story. Uh, here's a good spot to talk about the, the ways that you may be uh, unaware that you're not really on the right website. You're not really getting the details you want from the source you think is the correct or legit outlet. Um, it requires a little bit of homework. It requires being old enough or locally knowledgeable enough that you know certain sites are spoofed or fake or they sound legit. Um, but they might not be, uh, especially this example of ho hovering using your cursor if you happen to have multiple windows that you can open. It's harder to do with a messaging app. It's harder to do with multiple windows on your phone or on your tablet that you would take the time from reading a story, seeing a message, and then opening a window to do the fact check. Um, or in an even stranger example, you know, taking it 
to a reference librarian and saying, let's pressure test this. Um, let's look at who owns a particular website. Um, let's look at a name that doesn't necessarily sound like it's on the level. Um, the Philadelphia Ledger is a long defunct and out of business news organization. The URL is available. Um, there have been stories in the Washington Post and the New York Times about political campaigns claiming the names of fake news organizations, fake comma news organizations like the Philadelphia Ledger, the Tampa Daily Times, because the newspaper in Tampa is not the Daily Times. Uh, there used to be lots more newspapers, but many of them have folded. Uh, they've been consolidated over the years, but it's still possible to get a URL and build a site that sounds like it's serious. I had someone also ask on social media with um, so few corporations now controlling all of our media, how can we really trust from source to source that we're getting accurate information? Uh, I think that's where, again, it depends. Uh, we're pretty fortunate in the Boston area uh, that most of our news outlets are owned by organizations uh, that are, uh, I'm going out on a small limb here to try and make friends in Quincy because of the Patriot Ledger and other local news outlets that are a, a local news source. They're a counterweight to the Herald and the Globe as a newspaper. Uh, that you have multiple radio stations. Uh, the places where this has gotten to be a real big issue is in smaller media markets, in smaller rural towns where there may only be one newspaper. Uh, the TV station may be owned by a company called Sinclair Broadcasting. Uh, you may have heard if you're a news junkie or you follow the media business, um, Alden Global Capital, the, the fund that owns the Boston Herald, um, that has cut a lot of, of talent and a lot of resources. So yeah, the ownership definitely plays a big role. Um, if you know the point of view of the owners, if you know that they come from a political viewpoint that aligns with yours. For example, the Herald is fairly conservative. The Globe gets knocked for being super liberal and super progressive. Um, so the Wall Street Journal in the same way is considered pro-business. Uh, you may find that Pacifica News or other national news organizations that have a worldview uh, are part of, you know, part of how you decide is your media diet, uh, what you think is both reliable and if not reliable and objective, then at least neutral. Uh, I suggest in some cases that people go to uh, a Canadian English language website or um, there are various outlets from Europe the BBC or DW, where you can get news about the U.S. from a foreign viewpoint, uh, that's harder to do, obviously, at the very, very local level. Um, but the more diversity you get of viewpoints, the fewer stories you're going to get that sound like 382 people were killed on an airplane, three Americans where everything is America first or U.S. first or taken out of a global or a national or an international context. Uh, let me know if that answers the question or if there are specific either ownership or bias issues that we should get into. Uh, I'm going to stop share and make a new share for a minute. Uh, because we can go to uh, a tool called All Sides, uh, 
Um, and feel free to either thumbs up or wave or something. If you've used any of the tools like uh, Fact Check or PolitiFact or All Sides or Red Blue, um, these are all ways of looking at the same story from a different viewpoint. Uh, perhaps you get a conservative paper like the Boston Herald and you'd like to look at the same story about a political figure or a national story from a different sociological viewpoint, uh, a different political viewpoint, a different geography, because it may be relevant in certain ways in one part of the US than another part of the US. Um, this is a, a live window. This is a link to the Washington Post story I referenced earlier, the ways that websites that you're seeing um, are not necessarily news organizations. Uh, this was a story about a PR firm that set up a website called checksandbalances.com. Uh, it turned out that Checks and Balances had a point of view in favor of a medical clinic that was competing with Centara. Uh, you might not find that kind of level of detail, uh, say, for example, on all sides, but a national story or a thing like uh, virus coverage, uh, things like national and international news give you the opportunity of seeing more of what other geographies are about. Um, back here at the all sites, uh, the all sides window, uh, you get a chance to start by identifying your bias. What are the things that you care about? Um, identifying for yourself if your point of view on certain issues like the environment or politics or college tuition or transportation, uh, are they left-leaning and liberal? Are they right-leaning and conservative? And what news are you getting? Are you looking at Newsmax? Are you looking at MSNBC? How are your decisions of where you get news aligning with what issues that you think are important. Uh, perhaps if you're an environmental activist or environmental carer, you get information from your local Sierra Club. Uh, that's going to come with a pro-environment point of view. It may not be wrong, but it may be out of balance with issues that are things that you believe deserve equal weight, not just, you know, the issues that that activist organization has as part of the agenda. Um, question? So we do have a question in the chat. Um, Thank you, Kevin Chen. Um, so a, a dot org is generally more reliable no, uh, I wouldn't use that as a uh, as a rule or a, it, it is a general uh, I guess a, a point of order here to talk about domains. Kevin's question is whether org websites are inherently more trustworthy than com or other domains. Uh, generally, .org is a domain given to nonprofits. .gov, .gov indicates that it's coming from a government agency. We could do a whole separate program on different domains uh, and how you know what is the source of the information. Uh, .com is sort of universally understood as a business or commercial domain. So, Yes, you could argue with me that the website deadlines.com is more commercial than deadlines.org. Um, if I was a bad actor and I was able to get a .org website and make it look like 
a think tank or make it look like an activist organization by calling it .org, whatever the domain is, then yes, potentially I could try to get some facts past the goalie and confuse or mislead Kevin. But I'm hoping that by now Kevin has sort of figured out that you have to go deeper. You have to sort of look at the website itself and decide for yourself if the content is fact-based, whether it's useful to you, if it passes either the, the crap or the smell test. So you can look by subject on all sides. You can search by bias on all sides. Um, I'll look at one more uh, resource that's useful. Uh, what all sides essentially does is rank and constantly update uh, different news stories from the left, from the right, uh, from a pro or con uh, balance. And they use this guideline of very left-leaning, centrist and fact-based. So this is where you tend to see news organizations like the AP, like Reuters, like the New York Times News. You would find the New York Times opinion pages, you know, here on the left. You'd find Fox News opinion here on the right. Um, you'd find Fox News, if it's not a news program, uh, again, you know, you decide how far to the left or right all of these are in terms of do they line up with your uh, political point of view? Do they, uh, do they line up with what you think is the facts that are relevant to you? And if there are websites that you want to see, if there are uh, stories that you want to dig into a little more deeply, uh, we can do that. That's one of the benefits of being live with an internet. Um, and I think that, that generally, uh, are you seeing the next slide? Are we back to the presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, I think that in, in general, the, the rules of thumb are getting harder and are getting more interesting uh, because of this. Uh, this is a recent addition. I want to draw your eye to a tweet that is right here, and it's a single letter. So this is also Kevin's get out of jail free card uh, because I'm talking with all of you, not just Kevin, about the level of granular detail that you and I have to get through in a day in deciding whether a news organization is passing these tests, uh, you know, this is really critical. Uh, we're down to the point where a hacker can use one letter in a URL. Uh, and if you don't know that the A of this style is the correct typeface for what you're using, you might very well be clicking on a link that looks like Citibank, but the A is a Cyrillic alphabet from a Russian keyboard. So it is clearly, if you know what you're looking, it is a hacker redirect or a, a you know, a, an attempt to get you to click on the wrong link. Um, there's this constant cat and mouse game, not just in the news business of engaging the audience or trying to make the information valuable, but trying to get interaction, trying to get questions and answers, uh, trying to get you to click where ordinarily you might not. Uh, so it, it really has gotten to be more difficult to just have a sit back and get the news experience on the internet, uh, on a website, because so much of 
what's being pushed to you, not just ads, it requires you to click through. It requires some sort of, of interaction um, that may or may not be terribly easy for you to spot what's fake and what's not. Uh, I'm going to say it's not always a clue as far as the validity of a site. It's one of the tells. Um, if you're not a Citibank customer and you're getting an email from Citibank, you should know that it's probably a phishing or hack attempt um, in your email has been compromised. So there's a website called Have I Been Owned? Uh, please raise a hand, give me a attaboy. Uh, it's the URL, have I been PN, P-W-N-E-D dot com. Uh, you can check to see if your email has address has been compromised in some way. Um, there are, are lots of different ways that um, you may be getting served up websites. You may be getting emails in your inbox that you don't know how you got found by a particular list or sender, but for whatever reason, it's there now. Um, and you've got to figure out, do I click and proceed? Do I, you know, open up a new window or do I avoid it until, you know, I know for sure, for example, the IRS does not contact you by email. They will only send you a mailed letter to your address of record from your tax. So you won't get a phone call. You won't get an email. But there are fraudsters out there who place calls from spoofed numbers. They send you emails that's, you know, that are spoofed from irs.gov websites. Um, so all of those are ways that potentially, uh, unless you knew certain details, you would not have that information right at hand. Moving right along. So here are a couple of examples. Again, you know, you can spend as much time on fact checking as you have time hours in the day. Uh, you can go down all kinds of rabbit holes with or without crazy conspiracy theories, with or without uh, nutty Reddit and subreddit and Facebook groups. Um, you can look at who is records to see who owns a particular website if they've left that information um, out in view in a registry. Uh, you can use different photo and reverse image searches uh, to see if a photo has been cropped to include or cut out uh, particular information. Um, has a photo been altered in Photoshop? All of these are ways that things that you're seeing are potentially uh, not legit, not fact-based, but taken over by somebody who has a motivation uh, you know, to get you to do something that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Uh, this is another good spot to stop, uh, ask if you're already doing fact checking on your news, um, if you're already getting second and third and fourth opinions. Um, a couple of other shout out organizations I would mention, and they're not part of the slide, is um, there's an entire study of misinformation and the ways that people and different organizations, businesses, pol you know, political or activist groups um, are trying to get you engaged with their media. Um, there are college level courses in both the technology that makes it possible, the psychology that is part of a, you're invited, you're special, you're part of our in the know, very limited opportunity 
um, the ways that especially, uh, you know, are, are used in a way to motivate you to action, to make a donation, um, to interact right away so that you don't miss out. Um, these are high pressure sales tactics. They're not in the way that journalism is typically neutral or quiet in the delivery of facts. If you're naming, blaming, shaming, yelling, those are typically clues that you're getting news, not from information, but from an opinion, somebody who's angry about something, uh, someone who wants to blame a particular action on an, it, it, an explanation that they control or that they prefer, not from a set of facts that might be independently verified. Um, there are study centers at, at uh, the Pointer Institute in Florida, uh, at News Literacy Project. There's a annual conference called misinfo.com um, where people who are engaged in the various aspects of this come together because it really is a combo platter of educators, technologists, um, the policymakers, because there isn't a very strong legal framework about misleading someone online. Uh, there are laws about mail fraud or uh, conning someone out of money. Um, but it's very difficult to know online who you're dealing with. So the laws that are connected to misleading someone, catfishing them on Tinder is very different than, you know, bilking thousands of dollars from Aunt Mildred uh, because she thought that she was making a donation to a legitimate cat rescue fund. And it turns out it was not a legitimate cat rescue fund. Um, so another couple of, of questions, uh, that I often get is not necessarily about activists, but about focused news that's specific to an issue or specific to a, an interest. Um, and there's a lot more of that thanks to the internet and you can get, uh, a viewpoint on the day's news in just about any possible interpretation. Um, there's by ethnicity, by location, by age group, uh, by political affiliation, we already know there are left, right, there are rich, poor, there are uh, web services or crawlers and searches that you can do for just about any issue. And you can see what other news organizations around the globe have to say about it. And some will be very upfront about their point of view or their bias or their preference. Um, others might not be. Uh, so if you believe that your information needs to come from a female younger vantage point, websites like The Skim, S-K-I-M-M, -M, or The 19th, which are run by younger women journalists, that may be your news organization of choice. Um, we're going to see a demographic shift over the next few years of more people getting into journalism at a age and stage where they're not just looking at news wires, at newspapers, at TV stations. Um, they're looking at some of these interest-based groups as a primary source. Um, so grist.com, if you're an environmentalist, the Marshall Project, if you have a particular interest in law enforcement and the ways that social justice in policing or the courts and issues like no money bail. Um, the Marshall Project covers those issues 
in very, you know, rigorous and fact-based depth across all 50 states. Um, so they're very focused on those issues of uh, justice in law enforcement and equity in law enforcement in ways that perhaps your hometown newspaper doesn't have the resources anymore or your TV network is not going to cover that issue if that's a topic that matters to you. Um, that's, I think, where I would draw a distinction between an activist organization that has a point of view on an issue versus a news outlet that's trying to give you information about this topic without pushing an agenda, uh, without being pro or con on a particular subject. If that's unclear, we can dive into some other examples that might be a little more uh, broad-based or understandable, uh, but they tend to focus around issues that are really kind of hot button, uh, like environment, like traffic, like law enforcement, where it's a pretty clear pro-con rather than five or six different issues related to uh, a particular subject. And I think that's, especially on the South Shore uh, you may have seen it in the activist groups that are reporting on the Weymouth compressor. So the very last of the two slides are more websites and resources that you can use. Um, if you would like a copy of these slides, uh, they'll be on the YouTube. They'll be on, you know, uh, various places on the web. This slideshow changes virtually every workshop we do because like the feedback on the crap method. Um, there may be lots of other sites that you use that I haven't added yet. So my window is always open if you want to throw them either in the chat or send me a, you know, a, a message. Um, the last couple of uh, either sites or issues um, are particularly about the people who are trusted experts in a variety of these different fields um, because things are changing pretty quickly, particularly in the world of COVID, um, where what was fact or what was best practice a couple of weeks ago now has changed. So you need to be aware if you're clicking on a story, looking at a date, looking at a citation that tells you this is the most recent information. Uh, the web is not very good about making sure that your search results at the top are the newest, uh, particularly if you're using Google as a verb. Google shows you what is most popular, most clicked. It's not showing you the newest or the most reliable or the closest geographically to you. So all of those are different ways of deciding what search engine you're going to use and how you're going to rank order what matters, what's relevant in terms of recency, accuracy, uh, what matters in my town, in my county, in my state. We've got a half an hour for either sites that we can visit or stories that we can dig into a little more deeply, uh, issues. There is never a shortage of uh, political viewpoints that we can talk about, pro, con, and indifferent. Um, my background primarily is in the business and tech. So that's my disclaimer way of saying uh, I tend not to talk too much about the politics of what side are you on because it doesn't really matter to me who you voted for, uh, only that you voted. Thanks, Ryan, for uh, a buzzword. Um, I think there are a variety of them, and there are lots of different buzzwords or things that you can use to screen. Um, an example with me under the bus. I was not an employee of the New York Times, so if I wrote a story, it said special to the New York Times, or it had a box that said I was a contributor. Um, there are things that you can identify as, for example, Dr. Sanjay Gupta is a doctor. He's not a reporter. 
He may use journalism tactics, but he is first a contributor to CNN. Um, so what he's saying is not going to be medical advice. It's not going to be medical journalism necessarily, um, but it is information from a trusted source. So look for certain things that are tells from the reporter, from the talking head, uh, indicator that they're not a journalist. Um, they might be a first person viewer of what happened, what the reporters call man on the street. Uh, sorry, ladies, they, there are also references to person on the street. Um, but it, typically, if you go to an accident scene as a reporter, you look for a witness, you look for somebody who was there when the tornado touched down. So again, you're getting the viewpoint of somebody who was there, not necessarily the meteorologist or the journalist compiling the story. Um, inside of a news package or inside of a uh, report, look for the number of times that the person uses I, me, my, our, um, especially in political coverage, that's a clue that they're talking about their party, their issue, their team. Um, so a Republican who uses our is referring to perhaps the Republican Party, perhaps a subset of the Republican Party if it's a caucus. Um, our might refer to their home state delegation. So this is why I'm hedging on your question of there aren't hard and fast rules, um, but there are certain behaviors, certain psychological terms um, that come from somebody who isn't well-trained in the dark persuasive arts. Um, another one is obviously. Somebody who's putting facts out as obvious is telegraphing to you that this is my point of view. You should be on board with it. And we can agree that the world is flat. So if we obviously know that the earth is flat, comma, Ryan, all of those are tactics that are used by conversationalists in what's called mirroring, getting you to buy in by making it sound persuasive, using your name in a sentence so it's personalized, um, citing a fact from news reports when it's, yes, there was a news report that Kyrie said the earth is flat. That is not the same as a journalist saying, scientists agree the earth is flat. Have I answered the question or must debate club continue? I actually have some questions from some of our social media sites um, that I wonder if you'd be interested in answering. Uh, someone wanted to know if we should be concerned about how much bias is being injected into our media. Um, I caught part of the, the question. I think the, the issue of how much, again, is a personal decision um, and your tolerance for uh, OAN on the one end of the spectrum and Newsmax uh, versus Pacifica Radio on the very liberal side of the political agenda. Um, you know, everybody has a tolerance for BS that is different from my own. Um, in general, you will get less of it and less point of view or less opinion um, with the more centrist and more uh, fact-based news organizations. Uh, there's a really powerful tool. It's called logging off, turning off the TV and the radio, because there's a pattern of recognition. Again, the psychology, the more you hear the news story, the more you think it's important, the more you think it has relevance to you, when in fact the cable companies, the radio companies, they're just trying to fill up 24 hours of space. So there is a point of diminishing returns for everybody. 
Uh, Lord knows when my mom would watch TV cable news. Uh, it was really hard to get her to disengage and turn it off because it's nice to have somebody talking to you. It's background noise, but it does have a certain amount of impact because you're hearing it again and again and again in terms of headlines. So I don't know if this is an answer to the question, but I think that the more prepared you are to know what point of view comes with your news and where to get an opposing view or a fact check or a confirming diagnosis, uh, that's just part of now what it means to be a news consumer, because we're not, as an audience, going to see the same news except for a very sliver, a thin sliver of time on national news broadcasts. And those audiences are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're leading with things that are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to get in terms of video, uh, traffic, weather, sports, everybody has those three things nationally. So you're going to see a lot more of traffic, weather, sports, entertainment, because they, those are some of the categories where there is truly a national audience because we can all agree traffic stinks, weather is going to happen, and who doesn't love fill in the blank name of an entertainer, movie star or singer, um, where they're going to be the story if Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez are back together again. So to follow up to that, so for me growing up, it was always, um, when we talked about journalism, it was with the belief that we should be seeking like an unbiased, unvarnished, just the facts sort of reporting. Should we um, sort of come to grips with the reality that that's no longer the way journalism is reported and that there is bias in everything? And if we want sort of an, a balanced um, intake as opposed to an unbiased r reporting? Um, I, I think you've used loaded terms that I would like to unload. Um, and I think after an hour, there's a level of trust that I would like to give you another point of view that is by definition, poking fun at me. If it is offensive to anyone who's listening, tell me, and I will explain because this is a joke at my expense. Full disclaimer, I was raised by lawyers. That's why I have to do this. Everyone has a bias. Everyone has a life experience that informs their how they got to this point. Um, so to say that all news is, is not objective is both true, but it sounds like it's a judgment. So in the same way that a diet or a personality or a phone is a thing, you can have a good diet, you can have a bad you can have a nice personality, you can have a really evil personality. Everybody's got, but the more self-aware they are, again, their preferences come into play. I've given you facts and information. I've given you points of view. There are probably people out there who would say, you're not in the business right now. You're an old white guy who did this work and is not giving me the viewpoint of a young African-American resident of fill in the blank. And I need my news to come from that person because only that person reflects my experience or can accurately give me the details I need. That may be the case. There are lots of young people from a particular place, background, you know, they want a skateboard report from somebody who skateboards, not from an old white guy sitting in a chair doing a Zoom. So the bias in that case is get yourself a selfie stick, get out on a skateboard, do the skateboard report and find that audience. 
Um, we're in a position now where everybody can be a journalist. Not everybody can be fact-based rigorous getting two sources, getting information from official sources, getting reliable information, um, I can give you a skateboard report. Um, so I think that's where I unpack the terms like bias and point of view and opinion. Um, and, and I would replace that with, if you are for whatever reason, only going to trust information that comes from people in your demographic, in your area, in your socioeconomic group, you can probably find somebody who's willing to, to fill that niche. Um, but I think that in general, what that has done is given us the exact kinds of people who only listen to their neighbors, people like them. Uh, left-handed carpenters who only listen to other left-handed carpenters. Thank you. Um, and then I think I just had one other question. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how much you would have on this, but someone had asked about Section 230 and how much that has changed media, especially because so much of it is now online. Wow. Yeah. Um, again, just like the technology, we could do another hour on uh, Section 230. What was killed during the Reagan administration is something called fair use, uh, where if I told you that the earth was flat during a political campaign, the rules of TV media until the middle 1980s required somebody else to have equal time to dispute that as a fact, uh, as part of a political campaign. We're in a totally unknown area because television news was regulated in that way. The internet is in this bizarro world of, it's not regulated like media, there are not licenses in the way that TV and radio stations used to get licensed by the government to use the airwaves, gee, I'm old. Um, Section 230 and the constitutional rights to free speech, all of those are what allows websites, what allows free speech and social media freedom. Um, and it's one of the reasons why Facebook, Twitter, uh, all of the different social media platforms are having a really hard time with how do you punish people who use that platform to spread misinformation, to run for-profit scams uh, that would never be possible on the TV or radio. Uh, so tech, Section 230 is part of the issue. Um, there are a lot of legislators who want to try to rein in or make it clear what the rules of the road are going to be uh, because they were never defined in the 20 years or more that we've had a World Wide Web uh, police itself. It hasn't done a really good job of policing itself. And again, the best you can do is log off, uh, delete your accounts, get out. But what we've seen is that the social media platforms do an outstanding job of giving you just enough convenience or just enough of the positive resources uh, that you're willing to pull up with an awful lot of, uh, you know, uh, do-it-yourself nonsense because no local, state, or federal government is going to regulate who can yell fire on a crowded website. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. This has been very, very informative and I think much needed, especially in the climate that we're in right now. With so much access to information and hard to know what to filter it through. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone.